Dedication. This collection of the fragments of the primitive document is reverently dedicated to the memory of the great unknown poet prophet to whom both Judaism and Christianity are indebted for the first Bible. CM, August 15, 1921, Boston, USA. Do not ignore the past but study it. Study it diligently as being the mightiest factor among the great factors of our human world. Count Kozibisk. Out of that past we have come, into it we are constantly returning. Meanwhile, it is of the utmost importance to our lives. It contains the roots of all we are and of all we have of wisdom. C.J. Kaiser, Human Worth of Rigorous Thinking. Forward. Sacred Books Before 1000 BC. All Europe, no doubt, was the wilderness eternal at this early age long before the days of Romulus and Remus and the wolf, excepting the southern point of Greece. However, a famous civilization flourished on the coast of Asia Minor under Minos, king of Crete, perhaps the most artistic the world ever has known. Mr. H.G. Wells, of War of the Worlds fame, etc., claims the exquisite art was due to the fact that Snossos, Knossos had been at peace for over a thousand years. The Iliad and the Odyssey probably were composed hundreds of years before the first beginnings of the Old Testament. And there's a footnote indicator there, and down the bottom it says Gladstone gives 1200 BC as the date of the Homeric poems. Yet Matthew Arnold says Homer was rapid clear, plain and direct in thought and expression and eminently noble and Dr. Elliot says in the Harvard Classics that artistically in spite of their early date they are the product of a mature art and stand at the head of the literature of Greece and of the epic poetry of the world what number of authors in all the world's history have won a greater meed of honour than the blind old man of Scio's Rocky Isle Agamemnon rouses the failing courage of his army by assuring him Father Zeus will never be the protector of liars and the son of Nestor proclaims that all mankind hunger after God. Even if the Greeks were limited in the practices of their ideals by the intensely aristocratic form of government their ethical ideals at least apparently were as lofty in aspiration as our own. Although the writers of Genesis and Exodus make no mention of the pyramids, we know now that the Sphinx, Chephron, the brother of Cheops, had gazed across the Egyptian plains for over 2,000 years before these books were written. And the Pyramid of Cheops still remains one of the seven wonders of the world. The Egyptian obelisk that now ornaments Central Park, New York, was erected near the site of Cairo almost 1,000 years before the sublime first chapter of Genesis was written by Jewish priests in captivity by the waters of Babylon. These obelisks, which now stand in the Place de la Concorde in Paris, with the Place de la Concorde, in Paris on the Thames Embankment in London and in Central Park, New York, are of such antiquity that Moses and his boyhood friends probably passed them on their way to school, for the two latter stood at the gate of the learned city of Heliopolis. The superb civilization of ancient Egypt reached the climax of a splendor in art and science between 3000 and 2400 BC. At that time, some of their portrait sculptures were of so high an order that they are incomparable and in delicacy of modeling never have been surpassed by any modern masterpieces. It is said to have been due to their religious belief that the souls of human beings returned and dwelt in the state statues erected in their honour, 
that the Egyptian artists attained such marvellous skill in portrait sculpture so it was necessary to make the likeness as accurate as possible in order that the soul of the departed should reorganise at once the earthly habitation. The divine thirst for immortality has never been manifested more touchingly than the ancient mummies of Egypt that swathed with balsams and aromatic spices to prevent decay survived for thousands of years it being their religious belief that the soul could live on after death only so long as the earthly body with which it had been connected was preserved. The great Indian rishis however taught that the soul was supreme. unlimited by the body after death. So with splendid consistency they burned the body which the soul had left to get rid of it as soon as possible while the Egyptians on their contrary strove to preserve it for thousands of years. The Bible of the ancient Egyptians was the curious magical book of the dead that describes the strange adventure of the heroes after death, especially the Day of Judgment, when the heart of man was weighed in the balance of justice before Osiris and his judges. It is significant that the oldest book in the world is said to be the moral aphorisms of Tahotep, which had a deep and widespread influence among the early Egyptians. The legendary date of the beautiful Zen Avesta, both Bible and prayer book of the Persians, is 5,000 years before the Trojan War, but even if it was written no later than the 9th century BC, and few critics have suggested any later date, it would still be completely, would still, would still be contemporary with the great Yahwist Bible. By far the most magnificent literary monuments of antiquity are the Vedas and Upanishads, written by the ancient rishis of India sometime between 2400 and 1200 BC. According to Dr. Haug, these books are a vast treasury of the deepest philosophy and some of the loftiest religious teachings ever given to the world. The Upanishads say, Know thine own soul. To an Indian, religion is the very breath of his life and the one object of supreme importance in the world is the soul. The man who does not recognize his own soul is not regarded in India, even as a man. The Upanishads say, Know thou the one, the soul. It is the bridge leading to the immortal being. The teachings of the Vedas are that the one end and aim of life is the development of the soul or the union of the individual soul with the universal soul of Brahm or God. The Indian poet chants, From love, the world is born, by love it is sustained, towards love it moves, and into love it enters. In the Indian civilization, the ideal flower of humanity is not the statesman, king, artist, or poet, but the Rishi, the one who has attained the supreme soul. Upon the Rishi, the nation bestows an extravagant homage that is never given even to the most illustrious kings. The Vedas declare God can be seen and known, and the forest-dwelling rishis teach, Listen to me, ye sons of the immortal spirit, ye who live in the heavenly abode. I have known the supreme person whose light shines forth from beyond the darkness. Professor Rhys David, than whom there is no high authority, says nowhere else are found the records of a movement stretching uninterruptedly for more than 3,000 years. Nowhere else has greater earnestness or so much ability been devoted so continuously to religious Christians, and nowhere else do we find so complete a picture of the tendencies and influences which have brought about the marvellous change from the crude hypotheses of the earliest faith to the sublime conceptions of such original thinkers as those who put the finishing touches to the beautiful picture of the Indian palace of truth. China generally is believed to be the most ancient nation in the world. Its history extends back no one knows how far into the dim mist of the past. All the other great nations of the ancient times either have been destroyed utterly or have become the vessels of a foreign power. Assyria, that once was the terror of the world, fell before her old rival and enemy Babylon. The mighty nations of India and Egypt are subject now to a foreign nation. Babylon 
once the most wonderful city on the earth, Babylon, that even in the days of the patriarch Abraham, or Abraham, had a history of over a hundred kings. Babylon, whose luxury and magnificence never had been rivaled even by Rome at the height of her pomp, Babylon finally fell before Cyrus, ruined not by the Persian army, far from it, but by the dishonesty and corruption in her own government. China alone of all the nations of antiquity has kept her independence. To the student of folklore, the reason is not far to seek. From the earliest times, the Chinese have had a most profound reverence for the moral law. In one of her most ancient books, the Shu King, that corresponds, corresponds to her Old Testament, her patriarchs laid down the principles of right and justice upon which a state must be founded if it is to survive the storms of the ages, and they pointed out clearly also how their rulers, by violation of these principles, could bring the state to ruin. It is said that the whole nation has become so deeply permeated with these teachings that no one is allowed even to perform his religious sacrifices until he has paid every debt. The ideal of the Chinese civilization is that right and justice is recognized by everyone as a force higher than physical force, and that moral obligation is of supreme importance. It is interesting to remember that the distinguished Chinese minister Wu Ting Fang said at the opening of our last war, so long as there is wrong and injustice, so long will there be wars. It is easy to understand how in a national atmosphere like this it has been claimed by an eminent author, Ku Hong Ming, that the dominant note of Chinese humanity is gentleness. He explains that he means by this the absence of hardness, harshness, roughness or violence, in fact of anything that jars upon you. This gentleness that is the fundamental characteristic of the real Chinese is a product of the sympathetic intelligence of a people who live almost entirely a life of the heart, a life of emotion and human affection. In short, the ideal Chinese is one with the intellect of a man and the heart of a child, and the Chinese spirit, therefore, is the spirit of perpetual youth, the spirit of national immortality. The deluge myth evidently was taken by the great Yaoist writer from the celebrated Gilgamesh epic that described the adventures of the old Sumerian king of Erech in his search after immortality and was written in the highly cultural city of Babylon during a revival of literature under the great king, Hammurabi. The discovery of the famous statue of this king, the original of which is now in the Louvre in Paris, receiving from the sun god Shamash his code of laws, the most ancient in the world, and which are inscribed in the block of marble underneath, has proved to our surprise that even in the days of Abraham and Sarai, life was as carefully ordered in all its essentials as in the vaunted civilization of our day. Well, this deluge myth, myth claim, we believe the same, that all those biblical stories were adopted and adapted from the Sumerians, the Babylonians, etc., where eventually, not so long ago, we found out, no, it's the other way around. First there was these Hebrews, uh, the Awa, the Hebrews, the Chaldeans, etc., with their languages and their stories, their accounts, and then these others adopted and then adapted their language and then along with, the, along with it, their stories. And they became these adopted, adapted, adapted, adopted, uh, stories of Gilgamesh, the creation you know, with the pantheons of gods, and so forth. We always thought it was the other way around, but it turned out to be the reverse. Okay, so it says here the deluge myth or the flood myth evidently was taken by the great Yaoist writer from the celebrated Gilgamesh epic that described the adventures of the old Sumerian king of Erech, uh, today's modern uh, Iraq in his search after immortality and was written in the highly cultured city of Babylon during a revival of literature under the great king Hammurabi. The discovery of the famous statue of this king, the original of which is now in the Louvre, Paris, receiving the sun god Shamash, his code of laws, the most ancient in the world, and which are inscribed in a book, block of marble underneath, has proved to our surprise that, with the author's surprise, that even in the days of Abraham and Sarai, or Sarah, life was carefully ordered, and in all its essentials as in the vaunted civilization of our day, own day. 
It's difficult to imagine words expressing a deeper sympathy and tenderness for his people than those of the preamble to the laws of this wonderful monarch of over 4,000 years ago. I am the pastor, the saviour, whose scepter is a right one, the good protecting shadow over my city. In my breast or chest I cherish the inhabitants of Sumer and Akkad. By my genius and peace I have led them, by my wisdom I have directed them. That the strong might not injure the weak to protect the widow and orphan. By the command of Shamash, the sun god, the great judge of heaven and earth, let righteousness go forth in the land. Let the oppressed who has a case at law come and stand before my image as king of righteousness. Let him read the inscription and understand my precious words. The inscribed stone will explain his case to him and make clear the law to him and his heart well pleased will say. Hammurabi is a master who is at the father who is as the father who has begat his people. Who is as the father who begat his people. The Yahwist writer was a fine flower not of this Babylonic race but of their kinsmen. The great nomadic tribe of the star-loving Chaldeans, Abraham, whose home for centuries was the wilderness and whose lives were spent in wandering with their flocks and herds over the vast country that stretched between the two superb civilizations of Egypt and Babylon. About 1,200 years after the days of the patriarch Abraham, this Israelite tribe had expanded into a nation and had entered the promised land and built a temple to Yahweh and a palace that was the admiration of the world. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the finest gold. There were six steps to the throne, and at the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side by the place of the seat, and two lions standing beside the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side, and on the other upon the six steps there was not the like made in any kingdom. The Yahweh's Bible The great Yahweh's Bible was written when the Israelites were at the height of their success and prosperity as a nation, just after the notable reign of King Solomon. 300 years later came their downfall nationally. Their traitorous king, Zedekiah, broke his treaty with Nebuchadnezzar in favour of Egypt, and the powerful king of Babylon naturally marched against Jerusalem, captured the city, destroyed the temple and palace, and deported 10,000 of the leading families to dwell in Babylon by the banks of the Euphrates River. If the sacred ark of the covenant was rescued from the flames by the Jewish priest, its location has never been revealed to the world. Some say it's in the Himalayas and there's a guy who's been appointed since he was young to look after it. Somebody says, no, no, it's in Ethiopia. Somebody says, no, 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 it's over here. So yeah, no one really knows where it is. There's claims, but no one you can't be it can't be one on one place uh, three places at once right okay and yet perhaps the scripture says it was taken up to heaven or something like that but at the time of the writing of the Yahweh's Bible the world was at the feet of the Jewish king who had married an Egyptian princess and formed an alliance with the king of Tyre the queen of Sheba had come even from Africa the uttermost part of the earth to do him homage and hear the wisdom of Solomon with her own ears the unknown prophet who wrote this primitive document perhaps the most beautiful and certainly the most ancient part of our scriptures lived in the 9th century BC at this time before the religion had assumed its elaborate ritual men were on terms of closer intimacy with the deity and our author does not hesitate to use his personal name of Yahweh the tribal god of the Hebrews as freely as Christians use the name Jesus his quaint and picturesque document was written centuries before the Pentateuch. Afterward, about 400 BC, came the priestly interpolations, the Elohist scripture, the book of the priests, and Deuteronomy, the whole forming the first Jewish Bible known as the Torah or Pentateuch. The book of the priests, chiefly laws, rituals, genealogies, and editorial comments written after the captivity was evidently deeply influenced by the culture and the gorgeous ritual of the Babylonian religion. These interpolations added about 500 years later not only broke the continuity of thought but also utterly destroyed the artistic unity of this perfect little gem of ancient literature, the Yahweh's Bible. They were also the source of many bewildering contradictions, especially in the first 
and second chapters of Genesis. The explanation of these violent contrasts is very simple. The first chapter of Genesis was written not by the Yahweh's prophets but by the Jewish priests and was placed by them before the first chapter of the Yahweh's Bible as the prevailing belief of the people when the Pentateuch or Torah was compiled in the days after the Babylonian captivity. It is especially interesting as marking the wonderful growth of the religion ideals in the years that had elapsed since the days of Solomon. According to Dr. Bennett, the Jewish priests particularly wished to counteract the ancient belief of the common people in the creation of Eve from a rib of Adam. In the first chapter, the deity is represented as an invisible spirit creating the animals in orderly procedure, and man last of all. Male and female created he them, apparently equal. In the second chapter, he is pictured as a man kind-hearted but irate and living in a beautiful park or garden, creating Adam himself first of all and the animals afterwards to give him pleasure. Eve was not even a separate creation in the first myth, this first myth, but was moulded from a rib taken from the side of Adam. In the 6th and 7th chapters, there is also an interesting contradiction. In the 6th chapter, the animals are pictured as going into the ark, two by two. In the 7th chapter, they go in seven by seven, according to the Yahweh's account. A few verses farther on, they again are pictured as entering two by two. The explanation is that the Jewish priests decided they must have gone in two by two and that Noah could not have known the distinction between clean and unclean and so they placed their version before the Yahweh's one. As there was no division into chapters until the Middle Ages, this served to counteract the belief that they entered by sevens. The second mention of their entering two by two, Dr. Bennett says, was inserted by a mere scribe to strengthen the position of the priests. Constant delight has attended upon the task of detaching from the academic later overlay, this series of narratives, revealing in all their primitive beauty their personal charm and distinction of style or their own of their great different distinctions of style of their great author. Freed from this later overlay of interpolations, we have a connected narrative of great interest, a partial restoration of the famous document, the Great Yahwist Bible. The unknown Yahwist genius found many of his stories in the works of an earlier day, especially the book of Jasher or Jasher and the book of the wars of Yahweh. But his wonderful tales were chiefly the stories the ancient Israelites told under the starry skies around the campfires for hundreds of years. Sir James G. Fraser says it is the pastoral age depicted with a clearness of outline and a vividness of colouring which time has not dimmed and which under all the changes of modern life still holds the reader spellbound by their ineffable charm. The picture of Rachel at the well with the sheep lying round it in the noontide heat is as vivid in the writer's words as it is in the colours of Raphael. It's probably Raphael the painter. Right? And to this exquisite picturesqueness in the delineation of human life he adds a charming naivety an antique simplicity in his description of the divine. He carries us back to the days of old when no such awful gulf was supposed to intervene between man and the deity. In his pages we read how God moulded the first man out of clay as a child shapes his mud baby how he walked in the garden in the cool of the evening and called the shamefaced couple who had been skulking behind trees, how he made coats of skin to replace the two scanty fig leaves or fig leaves of our first parents, how he shut the door behind Noah when the patriarch had entered into the ark, how he sniffed the sweet savour of the burning sacrifice, how he came down to look at the Tower of Babel, apparently because Viewed from the sky, it was beyond his reach of vision. How he conversed with Abraham at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, under the shadow of the whispering oaks. In short, the whole work of this delightful writer is instinct with a breath of poetry, with something of the freshness and fragrance of the olden time which invests it with an ineffable and immortal charm. Note, 
The compiler wishes to acknowledge the deepest obligation to the great editors of the Century Bible and to the distinguished author of the folklore of the Old Testament, Sir James G. Fraser, for permission to quote from these books. The text used in this word is based upon the revised English version of the Bible, so it'll be the RSV, although necessarily very much changed, CM. Contents? Genesis The Book of Yahweh Genesis The Story of Creation In the day that Yahweh made earth and heaven and no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up for Yahweh had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground and Yahweh formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul this must be a shortened version, make it easier to grasp, right? And Yahweh planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made Yahweh to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Yahweh took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it up, to dress it and keep it. And Yahweh commanded the man, saying, Of, of every tree of the garden, Thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Yahweh said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground Yahweh formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto the man to see what he would call him. And whatsoever the man called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And the man gave names to all, cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for man there was not found and help meet for him. And Yahweh caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh, and said thereof. And the rib which Yahweh had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, while Yahweh, or which Yahweh had made. And he said unto the woman, the serpent, right? You, yeah, uh, God has said, ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yeah, you won't die. For God does know that in the day that you eat it, eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves girdles. And they heard the footsteps of Yahweh walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh amongst the trees of the garden. And Yahweh called unto the man and said unto him, Where are you? Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy steps in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you, you or told thee that thou wast naked, or who told you you were naked? Has you eaten of the tree? Have you eaten of that tree? Whereof I commanded you not to eat. And the man said, The woman, it's all her fault. She gave me the fruit, that woman who was with me, and I ate it. And Yahweh said unto the woman, What have you done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, he tricked me, he fooled me, and I ate it. And Yahweh said to, unto the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And upon your belly you shall crawl, right? You'll slide. And dust shall thou eat all the days of your life. So it's like mice, you know, anything that's made of the uh, dust, the flesh, right? The mice, rats, whatever. And I will put enmity 
dis, uh, dislike, this hatred between you and the woman, and between your seed or your offspring, your descendants, and her descendants or offspring. Yeah, okay? it shall bruise thy head. Yeah, these descendants will bruise your head, and you shall bruise their heel. Yeah, you're a heel biter. <laughs> 